right. Uh. All right. So welcome to math staff. I'm sorry, I'm sorry just math. Uh, welcome to math 150 multivariable calculus. Depending on how you're counting, this is either lecture 10 or 11. So we have the bonus lecture. So I normally give this talk in my probability class as well. This is one of the most important applications of what we're doing. And once you master this material, you will be at the point where you can do useful things. Okay? <laughs> this is already enough for you to be useful. All right. So the following is a beautiful plot of data. What is your first thought when you see this? Okay, one is linear. What else? It's a group. Uh, it is actually not a graph. It's for a graph. Oh, so you know, it's kind of, it's yes. A scatter it's a scatter plot. But what, what, what else should you be thinking when you see this? I'm sorry? Points. It's correlation. Probably 100 points. You can make a line. It looks like there's a good line, but there's something else that you should be thinking about when you see this. There are axes on the edges. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. How many of you have ever read XKCD? XKCD is wonderful. We should break up and I can prove it. I think we should give it another shot. You know, there's a nice part of their relationship. Huh. Maybe you're right. I knew data would convince you. No, I think I can do better than someone who doesn't label her axis. <gasps> now, if you take the mouse and put it over the XKCD, they give you additional comments on each strip. And on this one, the additional comment is, and if you labeled your axis, I could tell you just how much better. You don't want to give information in a way that's not helpful to people. So when I give you a plot like this, what is it talking about? So here's the plot again, force newtons versus displacement. So you might remember Hooke's law from physics that as you stretch a spring, the force is proportional to the displacement. And so I've chosen to have my observations basically um, xn is 5 plus 0.2n and yn is just 5xn plus an error randomly drawn. So I'm just simulating data. I'm not actually going to the real world. When you look at this, does it look like this should be the line y equals 5x? How would you quickly estimate what the slope is? Because it does look linear. Which points? Yeah, so I mean, if you look over here, it, it looks like it's maybe starting around zero. And so you, if you go over 20, you go up 100. It looks like a slope of five is reasonable. We have the data going over such a large range and it looks close to linear that I'm not that worried about that five being a reasonable estimate. Now where it intersects, you know, when you write your line y equals mx plus b, I have less confidence on that. And so what I'm saying is the best fit line I'm getting is 4.99x plus 0.48. So if I'm writing y equals ax plus b, I'm getting a pretty good value for the slope, not as good of a value for the intercept. But again, that's not surprising. Um, I almost wore my Ohio State shirt. I normally wear it when I give a lecture like this because I can then talk about the Ohio State University. So we're talking about the best fit line. No, I don't actually say the best fit line. There's more than one way to decide what you want your best fit line to be. And depending on what you choose, you will get different answers. So our value V is significantly off. And so if instead we used a different method, and I'll be talking about these methods, we used absolute values, another way we would get a value of 5.03 for the slope and a value less than 10 to the negative 10 for the intercept. And so the question is, which is the best way to measure error? And so I want to talk about regression. So how many of you have seen regression in the stats class or an econ class? Okay. Have you seen a theoretical justification for why it works or why these formulas work? Right, so for some of you, good job. Uh, for others of you, hit your point. Right. Uh, so the idea is to find the parameters that give us the best values. But how do we want to define best values? So here's a couple of possibilities. Let's say we believe that there's a linear relationship. Do you believe most relationships in the world are linear? No. So at first, this could be, all right, it's nice, but most of the things I'm going to have to deal with are not linear, so I'm not sure how useful this is going to be. It turns out that there are tricks we can do that will make this useful in a variety of settings. So let's assume we believe y is equal to ax plus b. So if you observe xi, you predict y should be axi plus b. 
Here are three different choices for error. E1, E2, E3. E1 is just take the observed and subtract the predicted. The second is do the same but take the absolute value. And the third is to do the same but take the square. Can anybody give me a reason why the first method might be bad? Yes? The first method can be bad as it can have be positive or negative, so you could be potentially subtracting, canceling out. Right. So if I give you, say, the lower left corner of the square and the upper right, can anybody give me the best fit line from lower left to upper right? Yes, two points determine a line. Unless you're in business, one point determines a line, which way does the boss want things to go? But you're typically in math, two points determine a line. How many points determine a parabola? Three. How many points determine a cubic? Four. Four. You know, a parabola is ax squared plus bx plus c. You have to find the parameters a, b, and c. Three points will give you three equations and three unknowns, and you can solve. If I give you just two data points, you can draw a perfect line between them with no error. So I could go from the bottom left to the top right and there would be no error. Or I could go amazingly from the top left to the bottom right and the two errors would perfectly cancel. So E1 is a terrible measure of error. What about E2 versus E3? Which do you like better? Absolute values or squares? Squares, okay, why? It's differentiable. So the absolute value function is not differentiable. I know we don't always do calculus in this class, but this is technically a calculus class. It is not just any old calculus class. It is not calculus one, it is not calculus two, it is calculus three. So by the time you come here, you've had at least two calculus classes. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to do something with all that material you've learned? So you just saw, and it's nice that we've actually switched the order. You just saw the video on Newton's method and how much better Newton's method does than divide and conquer because it uses differentiability. So maybe we're gonna be lucky here. Yes and no. There will be exact explicit formulas for the best fit parameters A and B because of calculus and one other class. And that class is linear, linear algebra. But it's okay, we don't need that much of linear algebra. We can, we can fake it for a few hours. Now, the second one, we use absolute values. You no longer have a closed form expression for A and B. You actually have to numerically explore. We have procedures that will do that, but you no longer have a closed form answer for the parameters. You can't quite see how things change as well. The way I like to phrase it is if I'm doing the consulting, I like to use these squares because I have a closed form expression. If I am hiring somebody, I want them to use the absolute values. The absolute value is very sensitive to data points. If you have two errors of one, or an error of zero and an error of two, the sum of the absolute values is the same, but the error of two is going to contribute now four. And so a couple of bad data points will have a tremendous impact on the line if you're using these squares. So you want to be aware of what you are using and what are the pros and the cons. You have to be able to defend your statistic. Later in the semester, I will talk about some of the work I've done with students here in uh, sabermetrics and baseball mathematics. And a lot of it comes down to what is the right statistic to look at. All right, so we're going to use the sum of squares as calculus is available. So here's how we go about it. So we want to minimize the error. So remember, E3 is the sum of the observed minus the expected squared. What you have to remember now is the variables are not the x's and the y's. The x's and the y's are the observed values. What are the variables in this expression? A and B. So we're differentiating with respect to A and B. So if we want to find a minimum for the error, we take the partials with respect to A and B and we set them equal to zero. Is there anything else we need to do? Um, check, the boundaries. check the boundaries, right? But clearly, we don't have to worry about the boundaries. As we go off to infinity for any value of a and b, the error is going to become enormously absurd. So we do not worry about the boundaries. This will give us the minimum. And there's results from which class that tell us the minimum exists. 
No. Real. Real. Whenever you want the existence of something, that's your go-to for real analysis. When you want to do the computation, then you go to linear algebra. So we take the derivative with respect to A, and we take the derivative with respect to B. And so when we go through all the algebra, at the end of the day, we can write the system of equations in the following way. So we have a two by two matrix acting on the following. Is there anybody here who has not seen a matrix acting on a vector? No. Okay. Um, do you still have contact information with your algebra teachers from school? Yeah. Okay, yell at them. <laughs> All right, um, give me one moment. Uh, we should play some kind of nice music right now. Okay, so I, we have now resumed the lecture. So plan B, Oops, ah. sorry, resumed the vector, lecture the wrong way. Okay. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'll just go through the algebra a little bit more slowly. So here is the expression we want to minimize. So we take the gradient. So we take the derivatives with respect to a and b and we set it equal to zero. And so the first one is we're going to take, let's see if I can show it all in the same line. All right. So yeah, so I can show over here. So I want to take the derivative of e with respect to a. So because I have a sum, and it's a finite sum, the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives. And then I have a quantity squared, so I bring the two down. Then I have the quantity to the first power. And then I have to take the derivative of the quantity with respect to a. And what's the derivative of y n with respect to a? Zero. What's the derivative of a x n with respect to a? x n. And what's the derivative of b with respect to a? Zero. And that's why on the bottom, we just get 2 times y n minus a x n plus b times negative x n. So that is the derivative with respect to a. And in a shocker, the derivative with respect to b is very similar. The only thing that changes is now we get a negative 1. We have two equations and two unknowns. So we set the two derivatives to be 0. Well, I can get rid of the negative 2s from both of them because I'm setting them equal to 0. And I now have the following equations, 317. The sum of y n minus a x n plus b times x n equals zero, and similarly for the next one. So this, these notes are all online. This entire file is online. Amazingly, this is the most cited work I have done in my entire life. These notes that I wrote when I was teaching mathematical statistics at Brown uh, almost 20 years ago. It is the most downloaded thing I've ever written. So when you go through this, we now have two equations and two unknowns. It looks a little bit worse because we have sums. But remember, what are my unknowns? A and B. So the rest of the stuff is just gunk. And so what I can do is the first one is going to be the sum of y n times x n. I'm going to just put that on to the other side. It's just a number. For the next one, I'm going to have um, the sum of negative. I'm sorry, I'll keep you that on the side. I'm going to have the sum of negative a x n times x n. That's the sum of a x n squared. But because a doesn't depend on n, I can pull it outside, and that's where I get the sum of x n squared times a. Similarly, for the next one, I have the sum of x n times b. And for the next one, I just do the same thing for the second line. We have two equations and two unknowns. If it makes you feel better, pretend the sum of x n squared is 17, the sum of x n is 5, the sum of x n is 5, and the sum of 1 is what? I'm summing one from one to n, what would that sum be? It would just be n, right? I'm adding one n times, big n times. So if I have big n data points, then that sum is going to just be big n. 
So I have an equation with two unknowns, A and B. And I calculate the coefficients by just calculating these sums. Have you all solved systems of equations with two unknowns? Yeah. One of the ways you do it is, let me substitute for one, bless you, and now I have one equation and one unknown. I solve that, and then I go back to the original. So you can write this in matrix form, and that's what I was showing on the next slide, is when you do the algebra, it's gonna be the matrix sum xn squared, sum xn, sum xn, sum one, times the vector a, b, equals the sum x and y n, sum y n. This is just a convenient way of writing the uh, algebra. And that's one of the nice things about linear algebra is it gives us good ways of doing this. So that's where this comes from. And it turns out we can always solve a system of equations like this modulo one small caveat. And so when you solve the system of equations, it turns out you have explicit closed form expressions for A and B. This is just what happens if you do the linear algebra. You can either use matrix math if you understand that, if you've seen it, or you can just solve for one variable in terms of the other and substitute. Now we're trying to see how Y depends on X. We're trying to find the best fit line. It may not be a good best fit line, but this will be the best fit line when we measure errors using squares. If we used absolute values, we would almost surely get a different best fit line. There is one situation where this will break down and will not give you an answer. Does anybody know there's one choice of the values of xi that will lead to this matrix is non-invertible, which will lead to the denominator being zero, which will lead to things blowing up. Does anybody know what that one case is? How many of you have ever done the physics experiment where they give you an inclined plane and you roll the ball down and you see how does the angle affect how long it takes? If you want to see how the angle affects how long it takes, what should you be doing? You should be changing the damn angle, okay? Imagine you always have the angle at 30 degrees and you wanna to try to develop the theory of how the time depends on the angle and all of your observations are at 30 degrees. Should you be able to say anything meaningful? I apologize for those of you who are sleeping. Should you be able to say anything worth listening to if you always keep the angle at 30 degrees about how the time depends on the angle? No. So it turns out that the algebra breaks down. And if you try to uh, do this problem where all the x's are the same, the matrix is not invertible, the denominator becomes zero, you can't solve it. As long as there's some variation in the x's, then there will always be a solution. And that's a wonderful thing to know. This goes back to the George Carlin routine. I didn't bring on board my grand piano, so I'm not going to look for it. You know, it's nice when the solution exists. All right, so we actually have explicit formulas for A and B. All right. So we have a function of two variables, as I said, A and B. The x and the y are not the variables, it's the a and the b, and we're trying to find how to minimize. Now we've done this for linear stuff. Um, going backwards. Oh, I had, I put the algebra over here anyway. Oh well. So this is, all right, because I was going to, I was going to skip these slides because this is more of the linear algebra, which we are not doing. So here is the um, algebra, okay. So to just you know, drive home the point, let's say we have four equals three a plus two b and five equals two a plus five b. And I wanna solve for a and b. Well, one of the ways you might do this is if I multiply the top by five, I'll get 10b. If I multiply the bottom by four, I'll get 10b. I then get 10 equals 11a, and I get a equals 10 elevenths. And now that I know a, I can substitute that back and get b. So if you haven't done linear algebra, this is one way to do it. Equivalently, you can just use these formulas now. Either way is fine. All right, so we've successfully found the best fit straight line, but most things in life aren't linear. So what can we do? All that really matters is that it's linear in the unknown parameters. 
So I could actually have y is a1 times some function of x plus a2 times another function of x all the way up to ak times some other function of x. Instead of looking at a two by two matrix, what do you think the size of the matrix would be now? K by K. K by K. And so we just did the special case when F1 of X is X, F2 of X is always one. You can generalize this and the same algebra works. You now just take the partial derivative with respect to A1, the partial derivative with respect to A2. The theory is the same. So what's nice is it does not have to be linear in the, in the observation X. It just has to be linear in the unknown parameter. So you can find the best fit parabola, the best fit cubic. It's still going to be linear regression because it's linear in the unknown parameters. All right. How many of you know Newton's law of gravity, G equals m1, m2 over r squared? Einstein has defeated this, but for all practical purposes, for what we're doing, we do not need to really concern ourselves with general relativistic effects. Okay. I'm sorry, if you want to, we can... No, we have a no. term on this next one. Uh, <laughs> on, uh, on Einstein or on Newton? Einstein. On Einstein. Oh, excellent, excellent. Yes. Yeah. So you know that velocity is not additive. Excellent. Well, for the purposes of today, we will go back to the Newtonian simple mechanical universe where we have this wonderful formula. Now, there's a natural justification for why two is a reasonable exponent. So imagine forces like yanking. And if you have a point mass, it's yanking. And then as you go further out, the total yankage should be independent of how far out you go. And the further out you are, the less you're going to feel. The surface of a sphere is growing like r squared. So if the force is decreasing like one over r squared, then the product is constant. And this is a heuristic for why a one over r squared force law is reasonable. The problem is if we try to figure out from first principles, if we try to look at the data, we would have to assume that that exponent two is unknown. We try to see what is the best exponent. And now we can't use regression as we've been doing it because it's not linear in the unknown parameter. The two is now an exponent. Well, the solution is given here, take <laughs> logarithms. So you should have a Pavlovian response whenever you see a product Think logarithms. Right, if you're doing math in the elementary school and you're trying to explain to the little kid how to multiply three and four, probably not a good idea to be thinking logarithms, even though with slide rules, that's how slide rules work. But if we take logarithms, now we have two fixed masses, G is a universal constant. We get the log of the force is A log R plus B, if we guess, you know, the force is proportional to the radius to some power. This is exactly what we did before. It's a linear relationship. So here are the 25 most popular cities from a couple of years ago. It always is interesting as to how you define the population. Do you talk about the metropolitan area? Do you talk about just the downtown? And if you plot them, you get the following. If you take the log of the population plotted against the rank of the city, you get the following. But if you do a log log plot of the two, it looks very linear. This is just to show you that there's a lot of phenomena that initially do not look linear. But if you do a log or a log log plot, they become linear and you can use these techniques. 100 most popular cities, just you know, showing you what a great job it does. Uh, here is word count you know, as to which words are the most popular. You know, amazingly, when you take a log log plot, again, it's looking linear. I want to do a few quick examples. And then I need somebody who is a leader. Right. <laughs> so there's going to be a challenge between your class, your section, and section two. Whichever section does better, everybody in that section is exempted from a homework problem. Leader is exempted from two homework problems. If you lose, that is no problem. <laughs> I, was thinking, I was thinking about doing that, but so here's a real world challenge that I faced a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm on the school committee. We have about a $21 million budget. We get about $3.5 million from the Commonwealth, not the state, the Commonwealth, this is Massachusetts, in Chapter 70 funds. We had 
three school districts, Williamstown Elementary, Lanesboro Elementary, and a joint middle high school. We amazingly had more school committees than buildings. It's a long story. It was an administrative nightmare. We had some shared services between the three different school districts, but we wanted to fully regionalize. And there's a lot of advantages to doing this. We could coordinate curricula, we could share positions more easily, but the state in its finite wisdom would not tell us the formula they used to assign and compute chapter 70 funds to each building. As long as each building was a separate school district, we were told how much money they were getting. But if we regionalize, they would only tell us how much money the whole district gets not how much each individual building would get. And we wanted to make sure that each town had budgetary control over the elementary school. So it was essential that we know how much money should be going to each school. When we regionalized, we were going to get about an extra $120,000 back from the state because of various incentives and whatnot. Anybody want to guess of that 120,000, how much Williamstown would get? We have about twice the population, about twice as many students. There's several good guesses for the 120,000, how much we would get. Okay, one is 80,000, but maybe Williamstown is a little bit more economically developed than Lanesboro, and so maybe Lanesboro needs the money more, and so maybe the state would actually give Lanesboro a higher percent, and so rather than maybe splitting it 60-60, maybe Lanesboro would get a little bit more, or maybe they would not get the full 60,000, but maybe they would get 50, not 40. So when you run the state formula of the $120,000 in savings, Williamstown gets negative 360,000 and Lanesboro gets 480,000. This is being recorded, so I will just leave it at that. I felt that it was possible to do a little bit better than that and that there might be a better way of splitting the money. And so I told people, let me do a regression. I will try to estimate the Commonwealth's formula and see how well we can do. So I wanted a fair formula that did a good job predicting. I wanted something that was transparent and I wanted something that I could explain at town meetings. And so when I did the linear regression, I used as my inputs the populations of the schools and the assessments of the town. You know, essentially, what is the property values in the two towns? And so I go through and I do the regression um, here's a couple of things. I want the solution to exist. It's going to give me three percentages, how much goes to each school. I want those percentages to be between zero and one. I want, the I want it to be stable under small changes, and I want the sum of the percentages to equal one. Uh, so for the first one, the answer is it does exist. The values are not always between zero and one. The values do sum to one, and they are stable under small changes. If there are massive changes, you know, if 50% of the people in one town die and 70% of the buildings burn down, the formula could give a long answer. If this happens, however, this is like the zombie apocalypse and whatnot, we have bigger problems than how we divide the money between the two towns. But these are real world concerns to think about. It's actually not a big deal if it doesn't sum to one because you can always rescale, but it's nice that it always sums to one. And so before we regionalized, I gave my predictions. And my predictions were essentially within $10,000 for each building. So you might, the percentages were not off by that much. The amount it translates into is very small. Uh, just talking about a few other things. Many nonlinear relationships are linear after applying logarithms. We've already seen this. You know, if y equals bx to the a, you need to take logarithms. And in fact, there's a little bit of a hint that we might be doing logarithms because I have a capital B for the constant and a lowercase a. I'm doing that because once I take logarithms, I'm going to let little b be the log of big B. So how many of you have ever seen Kepler's third law? All right, excellent. What's Kepler's first law? Oh, shoot, I also had a mention on this last week. <laughs> I knew it then, that's what it matters. <laughs> <laughs> so I think Kepler's first law is planets travel. Oh, oh across the same distance. Okay. I think that's the second law. I think the first law is oh, they travel in elliptical orbits where the sun is one of the foci. And then it's just like two distances. The second one is they, they, tra they sweep out equal areas at equal time. Yes. And the third law, this is one of these is not like the other, one of these just doesn't belong, yes. is the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the length of the semi-major axis. All right, well, if we just take the square roots of both sides, 
because you, you could always just take the square root so that the period is at least to the first power. And there's a hint that I'm going to be doing something like that because I'm calling my constant B tilde. And normally you don't introduce something as B tilde. And so now I'm trying to figure out, is this right? So more generally, I want the period to be some constant B times L, the length of the semi-major axis of the ellipse to some power A. I don't know what A is, I don't know what B is, but I have some data. So here are the semi-major axis lengths of Mercury through Neptune. I am sad that we stop at Neptune, but I will accept this. I know somebody who knows the person who actually hit enter to officially downgrade Pluto. I've heard. Wasn't that you the best placement? Was he the one who actually hit it? If he was the one who spearheaded Well, I, right, but I'm saying the person who actually hit enter in the. Yeah, they didn't want to do it from what I've heard. And here are the orbital periods of the planets. If you look at this data, you should be able to tell me what B equals. What planet should you focus on? Earth. The semi-major axis of Earth is one. What units are we using? Earth units. <laughs> Why are we using Earth units? We're on Earth. All right, we're not measuring things in meters. And the orbital period is about 1.0000174. So approximately, what would you guess B should be? One, because if, if big L is equal to one, and big T is basically one, then B has to be one. So when we look at the Earth units, this is a guy that we've changed units to make things good. So there's a lot of fun units. Uh, how many of you have heard of the Bruno, the Millie Helen, the Slug, or the Smoot? I will probably talk a little bit about at least one of them. So this is your homework problem, is to actually find the best fit values. You should get a phenomenal fit which means that Kepler's third law is experimentally, well, correct, or you could actually be led to it from experiment, from data. Now, Newton's law is not the only thing that's going on because Jupiter is also gonna be pulling on the planets. And in fact, this is how Neptune was discovered. Nep the orbit of Uranus was slightly off. And it's a fascinating story how people found the orbit of Uranus. So this is, I think it's the Harvard Bridge, might be the Cambridge Bridge. It's about 620.1 meters. Does anybody know another unit of measurement for the length of this bridge? Oh, oh this, this is the smoot. So we don't have fraternities on campus here. One of the reasons is fraternities have a history of doing interesting things to pledges. At MIT, they were wondering just how many smoots would it take to go all the way across the bridge. So they picked up Smoot, marked him, picked him up, marked him, and marched all the way down. And I love it, it's 364.1 Smoots, plus or minus an year. <laughs> so Cambridge did not find this amusing. They painted over the Smoot marks. The fraternity did not find this amusing, so they put the Smoot marks back. And it went back and forth until finally they set out to hell with it. So that's why on the bridge this. Yeah, so on the bridge, there are actually Smoot marks now, and they've been institutionalized. And when there are accidents on the bridge, they report them as so many smoots from. <laughs> now, you can't make this shit up. You never know where opportunities will lead. Smoot became the chairman of the American National Standards <laughs> Institute. <laughs> I'm just imagining his interview. Well, you know, I, I don't want to brag, but I am a unit of measurement. <laughs> but you That's take wild. whatever you can and you use it to make a connection. Years ago, I taught a winter study on cryptography. I encrypted the title of the book. <laughs> and I got a little pushback from Williams. Do you really want this showing up on students' transcripts? Absolutely. And several of my students told me that when they were having job interviews, they said, I got to ask, what the hell is this course on your transcript? And it brings the conversation to something that you are good about. All right. Um, how many of you have seen the birthday problem? I did it last time. I did it last time. Okay. Yes. Or like the binary answer. No, this is a different one. How many people do you need to have in a room to have a 50% chance oh, that at least two people share a birthday? Oh. I will not do this problem in this class. Okay. We should know why. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's not a challenge in this oh, class, right? Oh. Right? Yes. 
Wait, you two have the same birthday, right? It's, it's, it's not going to be a challenge in this class. You, I'll get you. I, I'm reasonably confident. Now, I do know people who had twins, and one of them was born in either 2000 or 1999, and the other one was born just after midnight. So they were born different years, different decades, and potentially even different millennia. Yes. But, so... If the analysis shows that if you have d days in the year, then you need approximately the square root of d times the square root of log four uh, people before you have a 50% chance. And you can do some numerics, and again, you can do this logarithm. You can say, I'm going to guess the probability is proportional to some power of the number of days. And again, we get terrific values when we set the answer theoretically was half. We're getting, when we do this, you know, I did two different samples. We get 0 0.506 for one and 0 0.481 for another. The exponent is really good. The intercept is not as good. But there's, there's tricks you can do, and we might talk about them later in the semester. All right. So what I'm going to do is I will stop the lecture right now.